So now we would just like to get to know you, the audience. So if you could please answer these poll questions. Question one, what is your role? Please select. Okay, thank you. So we have a 7% PSWs, 14% nurses, 21% occupational therapists, 7% recreation, and 7% PRCs. So thank you, welcome everyone. Our next poll question is how many years of experience do you have working in the field? Great, so zero to five is seven percent. A majority of people are within six to 15 years and 16 to 20 years is seven percent. And we have a nice third of people with over 21 years of experience. And the last question is, have you attended previous webinars in this series? Great, so 67% said yes, 33% no. So welcome back and welcome everybody. And well that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer and Helly. All right, I will get us started. So welcome everyone. Uh, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, we look forward to sharing our uh, brain exchange information with you today on noise. Um, so I'm also going to uh, start with a poll question. I just want you to think about a time um, that you experienced some excessive noise. And did any of these uh, following um, uh, things happened to you while you were listening or while you were experiencing that event. So if you can make your choice. Are we able to see the result? Okay, so um, it does look like people have experienced anxiety, confusion, or um, increased heart rate, maybe change in their blood pressure, or impaired hearing. Um, so noise levels are subjective and, and can, um, can vary daily, uh, depending on the individual and in the context. Um, so excessive noise can um, like I said, cause confusion, but also some of the other pieces that can impact um, delay in wound healing, um, decrease weight gain, impaired immune function, and also impair our hearing. Okay. So I'd like to start off with this chart because I think it really sets the, sets the tone and sets the uh, message about noise. So when we look at this, it really gives us a good idea of decibel levels um, in you know, daily activities that we may be participating in. So normal conversations usually sit around uh, 60 decibel levels. Uh, 
Radios, vacuum cleaners, heavy traffic can be from anywhere to 75 to 85 decibels. Um, and this is an American um, health and safety chart. And so they usually say around 90 decibels is the workplace limit. And anything above that, um, hearing damage may occur. So you look up to the next uh, slot above and uh, farm equipment, tractors, lawnmowers um, can be as loud as 90 to 100 decibels. Um, and I'm sure some of us have been to a rock concert before or um, even standing next to a, a jackhammer or a chainsaw and you know that uh, it is quite loud. So that can impact um, our hearing and sometimes even the next day, um, you know, you feel that, oh my gosh, my ear, I can't hear very well or it feels plugged. Um, so that can be as loud as 110 to 120. And then you look at the, the top two. So a gunshot uh, can be as loud as 120 to 140. Um, and then the, the top would be a jet engine. And so this is where you could see damage occurring. Um, and I think it's really important to remember that a lot of um, our clients or residents that we're working with, um, protective equipment um, you know, really wasn't regulated like it is now. And so you could see a lot more uh, damage. Uh, to hearing. Okay, so we are going to look through these different recommendations today. So we will talk and touch a little bit on um, noise level assessments, talk about how to reduce noise, um, production equipment and noise, looking at scheduling of intrusive noise, talk a little bit about background noise. Uh, one of my favorites, fire alarms, um, appropriate noise and positive sound. And then we're going to talk about kind of the social side as well around communication techniques, um, sensory assessment and accommodation and looking and monitoring at um, distress of our residents, especially those with um, dementia. All right, so our first recommendation, um, we talk about uh, looking and, and ensuring that knowledgeable staff use a sound level meter. So maybe some of you haven't seen one before, um, but your occupational health and safety uh, representative or maybe your um, uh, person in, in housekeeping or in maintenance uh, might have access to um, these meters. And they're really good at um, conducting informal noise assessments you know, regularly. And I think it's really important to do it at uh, different times of the day, because you will notice different noise, uh, maybe in the morning, uh, afternoon, and in the evening. So why do we look at noise? Or why do we want to um, understand more about uh, this assessment? Um, like I said, you know, it, it is subjective to um, each person. And so, some might enjoy um, having, you know, background noise or noise around, and some might find it very um, unpleasant. Um, and they do say daytime noise in healthcare settings can range from about 65 to 95 decibels. So we just went through that chart. So that really is in comparison to the sound of heavy traffic. Um, and so that is within our residents' living space um, in their home. And so we want to, you know, remember that. And as we go through, uh, we'll talk more about, um, you know, looking at reducing noise. So some of the easy or low implementation strategies to um, noise assessments is to ensure that noise assessments include um, sound levels, number of occurrences, and duration. So those are really important because uh, you can you can take you know a vacuum cleaner that might be a, a very loud noise for 15 minutes, but imagine if that vacuum is going on for an hour and a half. So that would be really really different, and making sure that you are taking that into account when you are doing those assessments. Um, and encouraging, like I said, the supervisor of maintenance or your um, occupational health and safety team and making sure that they're knowledgeable in the use of the, the sound level meter. So those are some easy things that we can do um, to implement um, some of those strategies. So why do we want to reduce noise? 
Um, so some of the recommendations that we can talk about are looking at acoustic um, ceiling or wall products. So in these pictures, there's some uh, beautiful displays of um, some wall tiles, um, some acoustics uh, tiling in the ceiling. Um, and so, yes, we do know that some of them are quite um, expensive, but again, as part of the process, if you're part of the design process or early on making some changes, um, these are things that we can look at. Um, so people with dementia are more sensitive to noise and specifically that intrusive noise. Um, so if we can reduce the number of hard surfaces um, and increase kind of those sound absorbing textiles like drapes or carpets or uh, wall hangings, that can really help and reduce echoes um, and, and making, um, you know, enhancing their hearing and lowering uh, that frustration piece for our residents as well. So whenever textures are being introduced, um, you wanna make sure that they're able to be laundered or cleaned. Um, so, you know, uh, wall hangings or quilts or um, items like that, that you can hang on the wall. Um, you want to make sure that they are able to be clean. So probably not a good idea to install those in the bathroom where there would be mold or, or mildew um, built up in there. Also to note, um, carpet uh, only reduces sound about 20 to 30 percent. So that's why some of these um, ceiling and wall products are so important because sound bounces off all of those hard surfaces like glass or brick. Um, hardwood flooring. And so that does create um, more echo. Um, and again, those echoes and, and uh, reverberation does interfere with normal sound. And so making it more difficult to hear a normal conversation going on, or even pleasant music. So these are some examples of um, some low or easy to implement strategies. Um, so this is an acoustic uh, panel that can be moved around. Um, so it's really good at kind of breaking down smaller areas. So I know there are still some long-term care homes that have a common dining room space. Um, so say um, recreation or programs wanted to run a program in that space, um, they could use some of these panels to help reduce the noise because if the dining room they were still cleaning or um, clearing up after a meal, this could really help to reduce um, that, that sound. Um, so again, it's an easy um, strategy to implement and, and really good for a larger uh, room and breaking it down into a smaller area. These are some other examples as well. So um, the gray and white um, are some wall tiles. They're like a sticky tile that you would stick on. Um, and again, a really good way to absorb sound. Um, the other piece, we call them sound clouds. So they're actually hanging from the ceiling um, and they absorb some of the, the sound, like a, a dampening panel. And then this is a beautiful picture of a, a wall hanging. Um, so again, something that you're able to take down and launder uh, and then put back up on the wall. And it is nice because I do find a lot of our long-term care homes have, have taken carpet out, especially in common spaces, just for IPAC measures and, and um, accidents and things like that. It's easier to clean on, on a tile, but we do find that it has increased the noise. So things like um, wall panels and that can help to reduce um, and be more sound, sound absorbing. So drapes, carpets, and textiles like that. So here's a picture that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. A long hallway uh, with a hard surface floor, nothing on the walls, um, and lighting and glare. That's another whole um, uh, episode that we can talk about. But again, these this would be probably more in the high cost implementation strategies. So this is when you're really looking at architectural features um, and how to make some changes. So again, I'm stressing um, a lot of the long-term care homes are looking at uh, rebuild. I mean, I know in York region, how many be uh, beds uh, we're getting in the next few years. So this is a really good time 
um, to start having those conversations with um, administration who are maybe linked with the architects and looking at features um, because you want to make sure that you are building something um, that will be beneficial for our, our residents and um, we're really pushing for residents to participate in the design as well because this is their home. All right, so now we can look a little bit at noise production equipment as well. So it really is recommended that we regularly maintain um, that noise producing equipment. And so again, probably most of you are saying, yeah, oh yeah, we do that, we do that. You know, it's on a quarterly schedule or maybe a monthly check. Um, but I think it's important even to recognize loud noises or um, think about um, how annoying it is when you hear a tap dripping. And now imagine if you're a resident, um, you know, that doesn't uh, have the mobility to get up and, and turn that tap off and you're laying in your bed and all you can hear is that tap just drip, drip, drip all day. So that can really trigger, um, you know, agitation and annoyance. Um, and so it really is important for us to uh, look at some different strategies and, and support the resident. So what are some easy ways that we can um, implement strategies? So simple things, um, you know, lubricating squeaky doors. Uh, how many times have you heard a squeaky cart going down the hallway? Um, you know, making sure that wheels or windows, um, you know, little things like that that can really impact on the quality of life for our residents. Um, like I said, faucets, um, and even our mechanical lifts, um, looking at ways that we can try and reduce noise. Um, some of the kind of medium level strategies would be looking at cleaning equipment. Um, so waxing floors, vacuums, you know, how, how old is the vacuum and, and now are there equipment that we can purchase that maybe has um, like low noise or, or a reduced uh, noise machine. So looking at kind of high quality or high cost um, strategies. So like I said, when looking or when possible, there are, are um, labels that say low noise. Um, HVAC equipment, we're taking a lot of um, time looking at HVAC equipment right now. So making sure um, that, that the duct work and, and the equipment doesn't exceed that noise criterion. So um, if you do go to the best practice website, we do have a glossary because uh, it does say, you know, um, you know, it shouldn't it uh, shouldn't be more than 25 in the bedrooms, um, toilets, showers is a little bit higher because of, of running water and the noise that that does create from tanks. Uh, so it's about 40. Um, but then we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to reduce um, or soundproof the equipment the best that we can. So scheduling of intrusive noise. So this again is something that I think oftentimes gets overlooked. So our recommendation is to implement sound management schedules in high traffic areas. So um, in our picture here, it's a, a buffing machine. So, you know, looking at some easy ways that we can um, support our residents in the home um, by looking at, you know, scheduling um, time to vacuum or buffer um, when there's, it's not going to bother um, as many people or they won't be disturbed. So maybe looking at when everyone's in the dining room, okay, let's go uh, buffer or vacuum the hallways where we can then close off the fire doors and it can be a little bit more quiet uh, for the people while they're in the dining room and then they won't hear the noise as much. Here's another big one, a uh, pill crushing machine. So um, those are quite noisy. And again, we have to remember that a lot of times when our residents or, or clients are receiving medication, it's usually in the dining room or at mealtime, and they don't want to hear the pill crusher in the dining room when they're having that social time. Um, so are there quieter ways of um, crushing? Yeah, we can look at mortar, mortar and pestle, um, you know, or, or different ways or pre-cushion pre-crushing the pills, excuse me, uh, before um, you enter into the dining room. Um, and looking at downtime, I think is a really interesting piece to look at. Um, 
I was just saying this morning to the group that um, my, da my daughter at university, and it was very clear on a sign that they do have quiet times in their dorm, um, which I found quite amusing, but, um, you know, times where there is downtime relaxation, where they're not going to be triggered by noise or um, uh, vacuums or lawn cutting, things like that. So looking at times of the day when you do want to have that quiet time available. Um, this one's important too. So limiting um, what is done in the serving area. So again, you know, dishwashers um, should all be done in the main kitchen area and not kind of in the outdoor space of the dining room where you're collecting um, cutlery and that can be really noisy, you know, scraping plates, different things like that. So is there a place or a, an alcove or a nook where that can be done um, to help decrease some of that noise? And then, like I said, um, scheduling fire alarm testing appropriately. Um, this is this is tough um, because we do know that um, you know there are fire codes and it's uh, mandatory as far as uh, monthly alarms on all shifts. Um, but you know, can you consult the fire code or or look at shortening the duration of the alarm? And so we'll talk um, a lot about alarms coming up here. So when uh, we also want to just talk a little bit about background noise, and we will talk about it more with Heli within the social piece as well, but people with dementia um, aren't always able to ignore unwanted noise. And so that can cause some anxiety um, and might, um, you know, might make them unable to perform um, different tasks as well. So it includes anything like radios, um, you know, air conditioners, PA systems, um, uh, call bells going off, or just a TV on as well. So all of those things we want to think about um, when we're monitoring and minimizing noise. So what are some easy ways that we can uh, look at that? You know, setting our pagers or our phones to vibrate so that we don't have that constant ringing. Um, Using music to draw people into therapeutic programs um, and then maybe turning off other radios and, and TVs once they're in that program to reduce noise on the home areas for sure. Um, increase um, and monitor noise at high traffic times. So, you know, our favorite always at shift change, you know, oh, bye, Joan, see you tomorrow. Oh, what are you bringing for potluck? and there's lots of noise at that time. Um, and so oftentimes that can be very disruptive to the residents because then they think, oh, it's time to go home. I'm gonna join Joan because she's leaving now too. Um, so being aware at those times, um, so maybe using a, um, a different exit um, so that you're not using the main door um, so that people are coming in and out. And even just thinking about, um, you know, even shift report. Uh, can be quite noisy because there's people coming and going. So those are easy things that we can do. Um, some medium level strategies. So again, um, that chronic background noise can be, um, you know, the air conditioner or ventilation system. Um, so again, you want to really monitor and, and watch for some of those um, noise or sound levels. Um, and this one, I think we can do very easily, eliminating overhead uh, paging. Um, so again, it can be really disruptive and, and confusing for our residents with dementia. Um, I remember I was in a home and they were doing overhead paging and the resident got really, really upset um, because again, he thought he was um, hearing the announcement for his train to go home. And so he started to panic and he said, I'm going to miss my train. Where do I catch my train? Um, you know, please help me, please help me. I can hear them. They're announcing that my train is leaving. And again, um, you know, so just simply eliminating the PA use or only as necessary uh, for emergencies can really help decrease that noise. And I always say, you know, we don't have a PA in our own home. Um, or even in a condo or an apartment building, unless it is an emergency. Okay, so here we go into fire alarms. So again, our recommendation is um, considering choice, looking at distribution and location of devices, 
um, and planning testing to be sensitive to our residents or our clients with dementia. So like I've said all the way through, high noise levels can lead to stress. Um, so you even stated that it is very stressful for yourself and it can cause confusion, you know, increase your heart rate and blood pressure. Um, and again, if a resident with dementia isn't able to recognize that noise, it can be really scary. Um, sometimes fire alarms can measure over 100 decibels. So um, as we talked about uh, on the chart uh, early on, that is way over people's comfort. Um, so we do know that there is the need for drills and, and that they need to be on all shifts. Um, but again, um, does each um, does each drill need to be a live drill? Um, so can we look at, um, you know, um, different options? And again, you need to contact your, your uh, fire marshal or your, your contact. But really, uh, fire alarms shouldn't exceed about 65 decibels in resident rooms where they can be louder in, in the hallways for sure. Um, so nothing really does state in a lot of the fire codes that the drills need to be a full alarm. So again, that's something that you want to think about when you're talking about some of um, the strategies to change. So again, looking and considering our population, that you want to go maybe to the affected area first and address those issues or what um, could cause our residents to get upset. Um, looking at a walkthrough um, process on a monthly basis. Um, so again, you know, we do understand the value in a full drill. And I know uh, because there was a fire in a long-term care home um, when I did work there. And so they have to know how to respond to that real fire. But, you know, can we do um, more silent alarms as well? So discussing those silent drills with your fire inspector. Um, and I know some of the silent alarms, uh, one home I was in, it's like a, a siren light. There's no siren, but it's a light. And so once the staff see that light, um, they still go through the whole process. But again, the, the alarm isn't sounding at that time. Um, and then choosing audible alarm or signaling devices um, that maybe minimize that anxiety. So I do know there is one home um, and they actually have uh, their fire alarm as a bird chirp noise. So it's a lot more pleasant to listen to um, than, the, than the alarm that most of us are familiar with. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Heli and she's gonna take us through um, the rest of the, the slides around social noise. There we go, thanks Jen. Um, so as Jen mentioned, um, you know, we've been reviewing some of the noise recommendations as they relate to physical design. So we're now going to be taking a look at noise within the social realm and exploring some design interventions. So the first recommendation is around appropriate noise and positive sound, with the recommendation being encouraging appropriate noise and positive sound when possible. So as evidence tells us, and for many of us from personal experience, we know that noise can definitely increase stress. The other compounding factor in many of the environments in which you're supporting people with dementia is the fact that they're also work environments. So from a quality of life perspective, we need to recognize the impact of stressful and intrusive noise and the impact it can have. So we're not suggesting eliminating noise altogether, as we know for many people that can contribute to understimulation, but really encouraging our teams to consider how we may incorporate positive, calming, or uplifting sounds. So thinking about things like gentle music or sounds from nature. So some of the easy to implement strategies around this would include providing positive sound experience through individualized programming. So thinking about positive sound in your environment and looking for ways to vary it throughout the day. Finding ways to really decrease meaningless noise as much as possible. And again, recognizing that your work environment may in fact be someone's home. And so being mindful of any noise that's being generated by staff. 
and using positive sounds such as music and doing that really within a person-centered context. So making efforts to find out about individuals' musical preferences. So some medium level strategies would include considering a commercial masking noise system to minimize other intrusive noises, but also ensuring that noise levels do not exceed the guidelines. And as Jen mentioned, those are available at the Design and Dementia website, which we'll be providing at the end of the webinar. And considering and balancing the needs of persons with dementias with other persons with and without hearing loss, both in terms of activity. So for example, television noise and safety. And so thinking about you know, fire alarms, which we just talked about. So another really important social recommendation on noise reminds us about the importance of our communication techniques. So here it's telling us to ensure all staff understand environmental factors that contribute to intrusive noise and implementing dementia specific communication strategies when we're interacting with persons with dementias. So again, recognizing that as the brain changes with dementia, communication can become increasingly more challenging. So when unclear messages are being coupled with intrusive noises within the environment, it can really lead to frustration. And at times we may see some responsive behaviors. So some um, lower easy imp to implement strategies would include the following. And what's nice I think about the following strategies is I think that these are ones that we can start using immediately um, in terms of our communication strategies. And so the first one here is using less vocalization and more gestures and or facial expressions. When we're communicating with each other, we do rely heavily on the words, but in fact, a lot of our communication is happening non-verbally. And so being able to draw on those, those gestures and the non-verbal communication that we can use to really enhance getting that message across to individuals. Um, you know, so would you like a glass of water or, you know, would you like a glass of water showing the item? Using a normal and low tone of voice and patterns of turn taking. So particularly for individuals who may be hard of hearing, we want to make sure that we're speaking very slowly and clearly and using that even tone of voice. Um, and another thing that we want to think about doing is that when we're finishing sentences or words that our voice isn't rising. And so thinking about, you know, would you like to have a drink versus would you like to have a drink? And so being able to um, use that tone of voice that's going to be more likely to be heard. The last one we have here is staff should not shout to each other across rooms or at people. So recognizing that when we raise our voice, it actually does distort the speech signal. So some of the medium level strategies that we could consider would include setting routines and reminders to wear hearing aids and to check batteries. So really trying to ensure that if someone is using hearing aids, that those hearing aids are um, at their optimal functioning. Another one here is engaging persons with dementias in meaningful activities in small groups and small rooms. So Jen showed us those acoustical panels that can be purchased to help divide up large spaces into smaller spaces. And so that does help with being able to communicate. And then also thinking about how we're communicating, what we're actually doing. So using very um, resident-centered communication to promote understanding, you know, using simple language-specific um, and culturally relevant statements. And of course, the other thing to always be mindful of is the background noises and background noises ability to interfere with good communication. So as we age, it actually becomes increasingly more difficult to filter out background sounds with the sounds that we're actually trying to pay attention to. So for example, someone's voice. So we really want to try and think about decreasing that meaningless noise. Which leads us into the next recommendation, um, which is an important one that reminds us to regularly assess and accommodates for vision and hearing loss of persons with dementia. So we know that audio functioning actually does become impaired for people living with dementia. And in fact, poor hearing has been found to be related to cognitive changes. 
So assessing and optimizing person with dementia's abilities to be able to perceive and understand the environment really does increase their opportunity to engage socially. We would also encourage you and uh, invite you to visit the design and dementia lighting recommendations for further ideas around how to support vision changes. So some easy strategies that we can think about implementing here would include um, gesturing. Again, we've talked about that and using visual cueing versus the shouting, which can distort our speech. Um, also ensuring adequate lighting and appropriate communication techniques to enhance hearing and decrease noise related frustration, anxiety and or paranoia. Um, an example of this would be um, making sure you've got adequate lighting on your face when you are speaking with somebody. So some thoughts around medium level strategies would include ensuring that hearing assessments are happening um, and that we're arranging formal hearing assessments as early in the dementia process as possible to really increase the chances of that person becoming comfortable and familiar and um, able to use those hearing aids. Um, another one is encouraging use and maintenance of those hearing aids. So again, things like regular battery replacements. I have actually been told that when it comes to, to hearing aid batteries that they, with regular usage, only last about 10 to 14 days. So again, it's something to be aware of and mindful of. Also monitoring for earwax buildup. Did you know that removal of earwax can lead to a significant hearing improvement in 10% of patients who may be presenting with hearing loss? Or making hearing amplifiers, amplifiers available for persons with dementia in your, in your environment. Things like pocket talkers can be helpful for individuals. The other recommendation is to think about accessing local resources to help us to, to find other ways to support individuals. So contacting places like the Canadian Hearing Society. Okay, and this actually takes us to the last recommendation we're going to be looking at this afternoon, and this is monitoring distress. And so here it reminds us to regularly assess the effect of noise levels on persons with dementias and make efforts to counter and distress by reducing intrusive noise. So when we think back to the poll question we asked at the beginning of the webinar, when we were asking folks about how noise may impact you, um, people recognized, you know, that we, we can definitely be impacted by noise. Um, and we know that high noise levels actually can lead to behavioral and physical stress reactions. This includes things like anxiety, confusion, increased heart rate, blood pressure, and fatigue from overstimulation. We also know that noise can um, impact the way people are able to sleep. It impacts our ability to perform activities of daily living as well as it can increase the potential for somebody getting annoyed, feeling frustrated and having um, some expressions of agitation. So some of the easier to implement strategies um, that we could support are getting all staff, volunteers and families to monitor noise related distress by observing for nonverbal cues. And so of course here we're thinking about things like facial expressions, uh, body language and behaviors that we might be noticing. We also can think about some of the medium level strategies, which would include um, where necessary, reduce intrusive noise and introduce positive sound. So thinking about things again, like the TV or the radio, and can we introduce some more gentle music or nature sounds as a way of trying to have more positive sound in the environment. Another option, if it's available, is to look at ensuring that there are quieter lounge areas available for those who don't want to be immersed in a noisy activity or a noisy environment. So this does take us close to the end of the webinar. Um, as we get close to the end here, I'd like um, to ask you to consider some of these key messages. So while some design strategies may seem obvious, we know that they're not always addressed. And recognizing that managing noise is often a balancing act between code, but also looking at how we can maintain and improve quality of life. 
So we're hoping that the low, medium, and high uh, effort strategies that we looked at today will, will really help you um, within the care environment in which you're, you may be working in um, to really find those ways to um, consider the impact of noise. So whether you're in a person's private home, long-term care home, or a hospital, recognizing how well-designed environments support our shared goal of quality of life. And with that, we'd also like to, uh, to, to um, bring a call to action for, for our participants here with us today. And really, we invite you to walk through your space with the physical design recommendations in mind and in hand. And think about where you might be able to improve design and focus on a strategy to make September your noise month. So we do have one more poll question that we'd like to throw to the group. Um, the design and dementia community practice really does have lots of great information about how we can create and sustain positive environments. So we're looking to find out if you'd like to learn more and if you'd be interested in future webinars on some of these topics. So we've got doorways, lighting, and wayfinding. And the poll should be up for you now. Okay, okay, so wayfinding seems to be our winner. That was, I think, also the, the topic that, that got the majority of votes this morning. Um, but we do have some interest in doorways and lighting as well. So thank you for giving us that feedback. And then I'm just gonna bring it to this slide. So if you are looking for more information, please do feel free to email the group at support at brainexchange.ca, but also here's the website where you can get all of the guidelines and the recommendations from the Design and Dementia Community of Practice. Um, but you will also be getting the slides from today's presentation as well. Okay, thank you, Helly and Jennifer. So we do have some time for questions from the chat box. Please feel free to type your questions and change the two selection from all panelists to all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see your question. And while we're waiting for people to type, there's actually one already from earlier. Um, what does distort your speech signal mean um, in regards to when your voice volume is louder, so when you're yelling? Yeah, so that's a great question. So you'll notice that when your voice actually, when we are shouting or yelling, um, our speech isn't as clear as it is when we speak with a lower register or lower tone of voice. And so that's why you want to try and project at this lower tone of voice. But you'll notice if I start talking at this volume, it does start to actually um, sort of uh, blur the sound. Um, it becomes much more difficult to hear and to be able to pull out some of the sounds to make the words and put the words together. So that's what we mean by, you know, really trying to use that clear tone of voice to help people to be able to hear and not have our speech become distorted. I think it's important to remember as well that if someone is wearing a hearing aid, um, that we don't need to shout or we don't need to yell because that sound is already amplified. So you can imagine if, um, you know, someone is shouting or yelling how um, that noise can really impact um, in a hearing aid as well and really echo and, and cause um, some discomfort. Great, thank you. Um, so another question is, I'm a frontline staff member with no control over the budget. What can I do to reduce noise? Well, um, I think uh, one of our goals with some of the low, medium and high strategies that we included in the talk today was that recognition that some of us don't have <laughs> that kind of, um, you know, uh, we're not in sort of maybe that that position where we're going to have a lot of control over design. Um, uh, decisions. Um, and so that's where we want to share some of those uh, low and easier to implement strategies. So some of the things that I also talked about in the social noise section, um, you know, those communication strategies, 
um, you know, turning off the TV, turning off the radio, um, closing doors, um, making suggestions around um, a scheduling of some of those noises that happen in your environment. So those are some of the things that any, you know, I think pretty much most of us can do um, from any position that we may be working it in within an organization. And some of those general um, recommendations around shift change, different things like that. Those are things that you can control as well. You know, how loud my voice is, how loud I am when I'm coming and going on to the different home areas. And like I said, you know, maybe using a different door so that's not creating um, so much confusion and so much noise at, at different times. And um, I think it's really important, like Helly said, you know, you're never just a PSW or just in housekeeping. Um, you know the residents best. And, and so it's so important for you to share that information to say, you know what, um, you know, and bringing it forward to, you know, maybe maintenance or housekeeping and, and saying, you know what, I, I find that um, the vacuum is really, really noisy. And, you know, could we look at, um, you know, a different time or, you know, maybe that vacuum does need um, some maintenance or, or something like that. So all of that information is so important in making um, the environment, um, you know, just more home and, and uh, improving their quality of life for sure. Great, thanks. So we have another question about fire alarms. Um, so many long-term care homes have concerns about using alternative fire alarms because of the fire department requirements. Uh, would mm -hmm. you know about the alternatives? So I think um, in my in the presentation, it did talk about that there really isn't um, specific information about how many times that you do need to have a full alarm. So I think, like I said, it's really important to have that dialogue um, with your fire marshal or your, your contact at the fire department. Um, because um, like we said, you know, it can be really intrusive and really upsetting to a lot of our residents. Um, so, you know, not saying don't have um, or have all silent alarms because that's not a good idea either because you do need to practice and, and making sure that they um, understand, you know, when um, that alarm is going off, it does create um, a different uh, mood or atmosphere for sure on the home area. So um, having that dialogue and, and really talking uh, to, the res uh, to the fire department to say, you know, what can we do to support the residents? Because it is very upsetting. And so what are some of the alternatives? And a lot of times they will um, say, you know, okay, well, let's do, you know, so many silent alarms during the month or, um, you know, let's try this on, on this shift and they're great resources. So it's really good to have that dialogue uh, and open communication with them for sure. Yeah, and just to piggyback off of that, because um, I, I loved one of the stories you shared with me, Jen, about how um, one of the long-term care homes was actually able to work with a local train to get their their the horn to, to not happen. So I think just, you know, approach people, talk to people. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, Jen, if you want to say a few words about that, but I just, I thought that was such a fantastic example of when we, um, you know, are able to connect with someone and mm -hmm. have that discussion and, and raise the concern about noise and its impact on. Yeah, yeah, it actually, I I should have shared that example. I forgot. Sometimes you have all these examples in yeah. your head and you forget. Um, so uh, it is a long term care home and they're, they back right on to um, the GO train. And so you think about how many GO trains are passing during the day. And for this specific resident, um, the train noise was very upsetting and they'd find him hiding underneath his bed. And again, he was a Holocaust survivor. And, and so every time that they heard the train coming, they thought that they were um, going to take um, and evacuate them um, and take them to another location. And so um, the, the home did have conversations with um, Go or Viva or whoever. Um, and so they did, um, uh, now say that they won't uh, ring uh, during the day at those crossings, that um, they won't ring the horn or, or sound the horn. Um, and so um, they pass through the crossing behind the long-term care home in, in quiet, which has helped um, a lot with, with, you know, upsetting the residents in, in that home. So 
I found that that was really good and just being a really good advocate, I think, too. Mm -hmm. Great. So last call for one last question. Okay. All right. So if that's all the questions for today, I want to thank everyone for attending this webinar. You will receive a short evaluation survey by email. So please share your suggestions and topics for future webinars. So thank you again, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe and stay well.